morning, everyone. I see some of our regulars. I see some new faces. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Halber. I'm the executive director of the JCRC. And I want to thank you for joining us for our ongoing series. Uh, today, we're focusing on the attorney general race in Maryland. And we have with us uh, somebody who I've known a long time, has been a friend of mine for a long time, in full disclosure, uh, Congressman Anthony Brown. Uh, but before we begin, as you know, there are a few housekeeping matters. First, the program is being recorded. Uh, and if you'd like to access closed captioning, please click on the live transcript button on your screen. And finally, after we hear from our candidate, I will moderate a Q&A session. I would advise that you get your questions in really, really uh, quickly because our Congressman has a eight as a 930 deadline. He's got to go down and take a vote on a small matter like gun control um, in the uh, so he's got to be out of here already so we can get downtown. Um, as a 501c3, you've heard me say this before, we don't support or oppose candidates for office, but these meetings are critical to fulfilling our mission to educate the Jewish community and promote civic participation. The JCRC serves as the public affairs and community relations arm of the Jewish community, and we represent 100 organizations, synagogues, and schools to advocate for the needs and values of the Jewish community, but also for the well-being of everyone in our region. And as you know, we're strongly focused on combating anti-Semitism, supporting the state of Israel, and are committed to cultivating a society based on freedom, equity, justice, and pluralism. Um, you know, it's kind of fun for the opportunity to, enter to uh, meet with Anthony today. Uh, if I may call you, am I, am I going to call you Anthony? Or I have no, to... that's fine. You can call me Anthony. That's great. I mean, I've had to call him Delegate Brown. I've had to call him Lieutenant Governor Brown. I've had to call him Military Officer Brown. I've had to call him Congressman Brown. But i um, been a long friend. Uh, um, let me introduce Anthony. Anthony has a long career in public service, dating back to being a lieutenant in the U.S. Army as an aviator and a JAG officer. And thank you for your service. He deployed to Iraq, received the Bronze Star, and has spent three decades as an attorney and served in the Maryland House of Delegates as Lieutenant Governor and the U.S. Congress. Anthony has been a leading voice on equity and justice in both Maryland and on Capitol Hill, including working out extremism in the military. As we know, it's become a very important uh, festering ground sometimes for white supremacy, fighting to protect families by reforming gun safety, and is a leading sponsor of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. He's running for attorney general to continue that work and dismantle barriers, whether in health care, housing, the environment, or the workforce, and give every Maryland a free shot. Uh, to get ahead. Anthony's been to Israel five times, and uh, I'm proud to say his first time when he was just a little old delegate in um, in the uh, in the House of Rep in, in in the House, and we went to Israel together. And about a week before, um, the rumors were around that uh, he was going to be selected as Martin O'Malley's uh, Lieutenant Governor of Bank. And I said, Anthony, are the rumors true? And he looked at me with a wink, which told me to wait a couple days and. Uh, was glad to know. So I've, uh, you know, again, I, I know Anthony personally. So he's a, he's a very dear friend. Um, we've been very, very supportive of Israel. Great guy, accessible. So if you hear a little bit of that, um, of that friendship come out, you'll know because it's true and real. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for being with us today. And if you could please start with the obvious question, why are you running for Attorney General? Sure. Well, first of all, Ron, thank you. I want to thank the JCRC for hosting this and bringing on both candidates and so that, you know, members of the community have an opportunity to ask questions, to hear our, about our background experience, our vision for the office, what the priorities will be. So, so first, let me start by saying thank you. Um, I do uh, appreciate our friendship uh, that now is 20 years old, right? Because we, we met in, it was 2002 when we first traveled to Israel. As you mentioned, I've been there uh, four other times. Once on vacation, I took my mother, who's a devout Catholic, uh, and wanted to uh, visit and explore uh, all of the holy sites that are um, so important to. And you were ready uh, to be a, you were ready to be a tour guide at that point. Yeah, you know, I tell you, what, I felt like I was ready. And um, so, uh, what I, I will answer your question, uh, uh, Ron. Uh, I will say tongue in cheek, only building on uh, some of the, the humor you infused in, in your introduction of me. Uh, you know, in the army, uh, I, I only made it to the, to the rank of Colonel, full bird Colonel. And um, you may or may not know that um, people refer to the attorney general as general. Uh, so because I want on my, on my grave marker, the, the, the title general, I'm running for attorney general. 
So you got a promotion in civilian oh, life. Yeah, and of course, only kidding. Let, let me just give you a little bit of background first uh, about me and, 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 and the stuff that you may not really be familiar with, and then I'll go right into your question. Because I know, you know, many um, know me as, you know, formerly a member of the House of Delegates representing uh, a district in Prince George's County. Um, some of you know me as former um, Lieutenant Governor with Martin O'Malley. Uh, which was a fabulous eight years of working on on big issues, solving um, you know big problems, um, and and now many of you know me as a, a three term member uh, of the United States Congress. Um, I graduated uh, you know Harvard College and then Harvard Law School, uh, college in '84, law school in '92. In between that time, I was active duty uh, Army aviation, uh, deployed uh, to Germany. Uh, we were focused on the Soviet Union, coming through the fold. Of in that um, uh, that operation. So now, when I see what's happening in Ukraine, um, it is particularly painful for me, knowing that you know we once had a large presence in Europe uh, to defend against that, uh, and today now uh, Russia is rolling uh, through uh, Ukraine. Um, but you know, my my legal education, training, and experience, along with my public sector experience, uh, have prepared me uh, to be the next Attorney General. And there are. Are, are big shoes to fill with Brian Frosch's um, announced retirement. I saw Brian Frosch yesterday at the uh, celebration of life for Steve Sachs, a former attorney general, one of my mentors. We practiced law together at uh, then Wilmer Cutler Pickering, now Wilmer Hale. And um, um, Steve was an extraordinary person, um, taught me a lot and really inspired me to, to public service. Uh, as you can imagine, the Office of the Attorney General is the largest public interest law firm in the state of Maryland. It has more than 450 attorneys, uh, 250 support uh, professionals. And, and, and my legal experience, my legal practice experience in state and federal courts, um, representing clients against big tobacco, uh, representing small businesses uh, against giant corporations, uh, defended the constitutionality of federal gun safety laws, the Brady Act back in the day. Um, and I've represented criminal defendants, children in need of assistance, um, multi-party litigation, class action plaintiffs. Um, that's the kind of legal experience uh, that is much more relevant uh, to the work of the attorney general's office uh, than I think any other candidate has um, who's running both on, you know, Democrat uh, or or Republican? Uh, the Office of the Attorney General's uh, is is involved in big litigation, but more importantly, and this is where I come back to Steve Sachs, as he would always um, uh, um, emphasize to his assistant attorney generals, we should be involved in the in the in preventative law, and where we represent every state agency, certainly when they're in court, we should be focusing on the things they do, the decisions they make, the policies they promulgate, the rules that they promulgate in such a way that they're working for the people, they're serving the people, and we minimize litigation uh, from the people. And it's that broad experience that I have, I believe, that enables me to, 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 to carry on in the tradition of uh, Steve Sachs. Uh, also, I'm the only candidate that has executive experience, both legal and non-legal, as lieutenant governor, you know, leading state government, um, and as an attorney. Um, when I was in the Army, I was as a colonel, um, I commanded an Army legal support organization of 80 lawyers and paralegals. Uh, we represented soldiers in criminal cases, providing legal assistance. Uh, with estate planning, uh, and we also educate and advocate for soldiers and their families on consumer protection matters. And Anthony, the most did, Anthony, in that role, were you, were, were you also a, uh, did, in the Army, is it, does it, do, are you also a prosecutor and a defense attorney in the same unit, or is it just devoted to one? Yeah, so typically they're separated out, um, so um, as not to present conflicts uh, okay, of interest. Okay. Um, so we we were providing um, criminal defense, um, okay. and there is a there is trial counsel units that that prosecute. Okay. Um, so so you know that's part of my experience in Annapolis. Uh, I served as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, um, and when I was in the General Assembly, um, and when I was Lieutenant Governor. Um, I led a number of efforts that are particularly relevant to the responsibilities of the Office of the Attorney General, including 
you know, led the effort to enact the Maryland False Health Health Claims Act, uh, which, you know, since 2011, we've recovered $160 million on behalf of taxpayers and to help keep insurance premiums uh, from going, uh, from rising even faster. Uh, I uh, was uh, uh, leading the effort to repeal the death penalty. Um, I led the effort to grant judges the power to order domestic abusers to surrender their firearms when they issue protective orders. We wrestle with that issue on Capitol Hill. Um, I led the effort to establish the criminal offense of intentional uh, child neglect. I was surprised to learn that Maryland was only one of three states that had not uh, created that criminal offense. Um, and I was the public outreach effort uh, that led to the ban on certain assault weapons. You remember back in 2013 when Maryland and Connecticut were the only states that were able to get something meaningful done uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the, the Sandy Hook massacre. And we also banned large capacity magazines. We, we passed a broader fingerprint based background check um, that's now required in Maryland before you can purchase a firearm. And as we were talking before all the other participants were invited into this Zoom, you know, and today on Capitol Hill, or that certainly this week, uh, we are going to pass for the first time in 30 years, uh, some meaningful gun safety regulations. And um, my team, we have our fingerprints, yes, a pun is intended, on three, on two of the three major items that are in that bill. For the first time, Congress will send to the president um, a provision that closes the, the 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 boyfriend loophole in our domestic violence laws. Can I you explain that, you explain that uh, Anthony? A lot of people don't understand what the boyfriend loophole means. Sure. And I sponsored that bill six years ago. So what it means is under most state laws, if you are uh, charged and, and convicted of domestic violence, it's typically limited to relationships of where where the parties are married or where they have a child together. Um, oh. But where and as we see often, Two people living together, they're intimate in many ways, uh, no child, um, but there is an abusive um, uh, relationship. We, we uh, offered a bill to expand the definition of domestic violence to include what we call the boyfriend loophole, to close that loophole. And, and in the, in the um, gun safety regulations that, that we are likely to pass this week, we're going to send to President Biden at one of the three provisions is um, if you are um, um, uh, convicted of an offense against a, a victim that you're not married to, you don't have a child with, but the prosecutor can prove there's an intimate relationship, you then will go on the no buy list, um, mm -hmm. just like every other domestic abuser. And again, my, my team filed that bill three years ago. Uh, the second piece where we have our fingerprints on um, is um, I was the author. Um, I, I, I filed the bill four years ago after the, 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 the mass shooting in Parkland, Florida, uh, to raise the age uh, to purchase an assault rifle from 18 to 21. I'd like to outright ban assault weapons, but I also know that it's not likely that that'll happen. So let's take an incremental step forward and raise the age to put it on par with the age 21 to buy a handgun. Well, we're not, it doesn't look like the Senate's going to accept the raise the age, but <laughs> What it looks like they're going to do for anyone under 21, it will be an enhanced background check. The period will be longer to complete the check. And we can now look at what have been sealed records like records in juvenile court or mental health records. Those will be open for, for minors. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work that my team has done. How do you, pre how do you protect against invasive... Uh, look, uh, JCRC has been on record for decades for an assault weapons ban. There's a, we're on equivocal where we stand, but how we, we've also been on protection of people's individual rights. How do you make sure that like uh, people who have been guaranteed that their records have been sealed or people who have gone for mental health counseling and have been protective confidentiality uh, don't have their personal stuff put on display at, and at the same time balance that against the need to keep guns out of society? Sure. And, and look, this is a very narrow exception. Um, to um, uh, being able to access those records. Uh, it's very narrow. Um, it is, um, it, it comes up in the, it'll, it'll be triggered, if you will. Again, it, it'll, it'll, it'll apply uh, when someone uh, looks to purchase a, a, um, um, a firearm, uh, someone under 21, and then law enforcement, very limited, 
um, will be able to access those records. It's not as if those records are not accessible today under other circumstances. So this will not be the first time that we're able to sort of like pierce some veil of, 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 of you know, um, uh, to, to look at these records. Uh, there, are, there, are other, uh, there are other incidents where juvenile records can be reviewed and, and also under certain circumstances, typically upon order of a court where you can review someone's uh, mental and other health records. So it's not as if, uh, these records have, are are never available. Oh, okay. We're just creating yet a narrow exception in in statute, so you don't have to go through a higher hurdle of going to court uh, uh, to be able to access those records for the purposes of, of a background check, a firearms background check. So we think that that there's a real balance uh, that 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 is there. It's a very narrow okay. exception. Um, so, look, that's really the background I want to give you. There's a lot of stuff I'm doing on Capitol Hill that's related to the work of the Office of the Attorney General that reflects my values, whether it's taking on extremists in the military, fighting against racial and ethnic disparities in the military, supporting, and Ron mentioned, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Extension Act. Um, but let's just open it up uh, to uh uh, to, to questions, Ron, if that's okay with you. Yeah, or, sure. Or I'm gonna, I, I have a couple of questions that based on what you said, I'm giving our friends a um, some time to give me their questions up here. Um, one thing that I think, um, what is the relationship between the attorney general's office and the individual state's attorneys, prosecutors in counties? Like, like wh what is the relationship? I think, you know, a lot of people don't understand, you know, you know, sort of like the limitations on what the attorney general of the state is focused on and what the local prosecutors are and where those where they work in collaboration and where there's lines of demarcation. Sure, and it's mostly in an informal relationship. Um, there is uh, no constitutional, statutory uh, either oh, uh, uh, okay. line dotted or otherwise. Um, but certainly, um, there is the need for. Uh, a partnership, and Brian has established a um, a strong partnership with states attorneys around the around the state um, in the in the states attorneys office, whether it's McCarthy in uh, in Montgomery County or Aisha Brayboy in Prince George's. Um, it's it's the attorney general is in partnership with those states attorneys who really address ninety five plus percent uh, of the crime fighting um, effort. Uh, the prosecutions, the investigations and prosecutions of crime in our state. However, having said that, the attorney general uh, does have a criminal division. It's made up of about 40 or so attorneys, so it's less than 10 percent of the office. Uh, and through the organized crime unit, which only has 12 attorneys, and one of the things I'd like to do is expand the size of that unit, um, we focus on narcotics trafficking, gun trafficking, um, uh, human trafficking, uh, and we also provide support uh, upon request uh, of local state's attorneys. We, as the attorney general, you cannot just parachute into a, a, a county or the city of Baltimore, I think as Governor Hogan would want us to, uh, and, and sort of commandeer and take over and start setting the priorities. It's not the way it works. You, the attorney general doesn't have the authority. So you need to have a relationship where the state's attorney invites you in um, to partner with them, help setting their strategy, um, and implementing that strategy. And while I did mention, or I should mention, uh, that I would seek to increase the size of the organized crime uh, unit, um, I also want to emphasize that I don't think that we're going to investigate and prosecute our way uh, to safe neighborhoods in Maryland uh, if we're not also focused on the necessary reforms, uh, whether it's in our juvenile justice system, whether it's in policing, or whether it's in reducing recidivism. And I'm more than happy uh, to, to go into depth on any one of those uh, issues as well. And finally, let me say on, on, on the role with the state's attorneys and the attorney general, um, com combating hate crimes um, um, is primarily uh, with the state's attorneys. And you, what you typically see is you'll see a crime uh, and then uh, coupled with that will be a, a charge for a hate crime that's related to that underlying crime. When you find that it's race, racially or, or ethnically or, or due to faith um, motivated. Um, the, you don't see hate crimes uh, brought often by the attorney general because the focus of the attorney general's office is often on that, those crimes like drug trafficking, which rarely you see a, a hate crime relationship there. Um, so what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to seek authority from the General Assembly 
uh, for the attorney general to bring independent hate crimes. Not because I, 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 I want to undermine the efforts of the state's attorney or somehow usurp their role, but I think there will be time when you need to elevate certain crimes, hate crimes, uh, whether it's perpetrated against, you know, um, uh, people worshiping in a synagogue or students attending um, uh, classes uh, at historically black college and university. I think the attorney general should be able to take on um, hate crimes when particularly we need to send a very strong message that in Maryland, those are not tolerated. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to admit, you know, I'm very concerned about that, as I'm assuming many people are on this call, you know, for the last, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it accelerated during the Trump administration, but it was already on a bit of a rising trajectory even before Trump came into office, was that if you look at the local police statistics regionally, Fairfax, D.C., and Maryland, um, acts of anti thank, thank God most of the time it's just vandalism, and it's not, you know, and it's not a crime of an assault, but crimes against the Jewish community are up astronomically. I mean, Jews constitute, if you just look at religious-based hate crimes, the Jewish community is the number one target of religious-based hate crimes in the United States. We comprise about 2% of the population, but about 60% of hate crimes on a religious basis are, are, are based against the Jewish community. And we're also very concerned in particular about the rise of crime against African-Americans, against Latinos, against Hindus, Buddhists, member of the um, Sikhs because they wear turbans and are often confused, as I say, with Muslims and get assaulted, members of the LGBTQ community, and it's happening all over the place. Um, and it's a very scary time. I mean, a lot of people are, 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 are just, um, I have heard people talking to me confidentially, even though I'm Jewish and not a priest, uh, people go ahead and, and share their thoughts with me very often. And people are telling me, you know, not every day, but every once in a while, but like, you know, I'm really concerned to go out there and things are getting dangerous. I'm worried about where America's heading. And I'm, you know, I'm glad I live in Maryland because I feel like I have, I live in a little safe haven. And I think, you know, part of your role in ways that, you know, as state's attorney, if you should win, uh, attorney general would be how you can like reassure people that Maryland is going to try to be an oasis from this, um, sickening trend in American society towards hate because it, it, it's going. I mean, it's there. There's no, the, 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 every piece of empirical evidence is that American society is heading in the wrong direction when it comes to to tolerance and respect of others. So that look, and and we are seeing that across the country, uh, and Maryland is not immune from that. Um, that's why in Capitol Hill, I did uh, uh, co-sponsor the No Hate Act, which we passed and we sent to uh, President Biden for signature. Uh, and as you know, it, it, it improves the collection um, of federal hate crime statistics, and it does provide the Department of Justice the, the ability to better analyze these crimes and provide funding to the state and local level to track hate crimes often. And that's going to require a lot of training of local law enforcement, because what, what sometimes happens is, and as you can imagine, when, when decisions are made to to prosecute and before that to indict and before that to arrest and, and detain, right? As you're working your way backwards in, in this criminal process, low justice process, law enforcement, a lot of it often comes down to what that police report says and, and what the police officer believes is or is not happening. And there needs to be more training uh, among law enforcement as to what is sort of, you know, let's say bias, um, whether it's racial or anti-Semitic bias, and what's actually a hate crime. And when it's a hate crime, you've got to, from the very first police report that it's written, you've got to make sure you document it in a way, because that is often what makes or breaks uh, these cases, what is first memorialized in this police report. So there's more federal funding for that. And, and as attorney general, um, my responsibility as chief legal officer in the state will be to work with law enforcement, all the, the academies and the ongoing professional training to make sure that, lo that law enforcement uh, knows how to spot, identify, and, 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 and document uh, these acts. I also voted for the Domestic Terror Prevention Act, which I think was like three weeks ago um, uh, after uh, the back-to-back -back, um, um, mass uh, shootings uh, in uh, Buffalo and Uvalde. Um, and um, and, and, and also I, I, I'm going to, I will have the responsibility as the attorney general, should I be elected, uh, to 
uh, work with Senator Hellman and Delegate Rosenberg. You know that they created the task force that's going to make recommendations on fighting um, domestic terrorism and extremism. Um, and the Attorney General is going to have a very important role to play in shaping those recommendations. Brian did a great job in creating a hate crimes task force. Uh, it engages a broad cross section of the community uh, to, uh, again, make recommendations on how to better respond to hate crimes and, and bias incidents. I'm going to build on the work of that, that task force, expand it, and also expand the hate crimes hotline with the additional federal dollars that are going to come uh, from that No Hate Act that I mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm focused on the issue. It's not a new issue for me. Um, I've been fighting this fight on Capitol Hill for the for the last six years. Okay, we're gonna start. We're gonna start our questions. I'm just gonna before I do, I'm gonna make one request. Um, Anthony, you know, in Montgomery County, we became, and I'm very proud to say this, and I should also note the presence of Councilman Tom Hucker. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Um, Montgomery County became the first local jurisdiction in the United States to provide security funding that uh, security operating dollars. So there's an 800, it was a 700, they just, the council just increased it by 100,000. There are now operating funds, a synagogue, a church, a religiously affiliated but non-sectarian organization can apply up to $20,000 to help pay for off-duty police officers. We've learned that two things matter when it comes to protecting um, uh, these institutions against uh, what could happen to the synagogue in Texas or what happened, anyway, number one, Police officers outside do dissuade people from attacking facilities. That's just a common, that's just, that's just that, that we know that. And number two is we know that the training that they were, that, 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 that people receive, which is in plentiful supply, frankly, and people need to just take more advantage of it, is a lifesaver. And we know that, you know, that, that people have been trained on how to have muscle memory, like what to do, you know, very simple, you know, you know, fight, flee, you know, whatever. And, and, and to know has been, so I'm going to request that if, if, as, as, you know, I'm not asking you to make a public commitment, but as, as, as uh, attorney general, that um, if you could work to get the state to match local jurisdictions, um, because not only do we need to increase the amount of money per synagogue or per church or per mosque that we go out to provide security. And but we need operating dollars. As you know, at the state level, it's very easy. It's, you know, it's a lot easier to give out capital dollars than it is to give out operating dollars from the budget. We need those. And also because, you know, they're beginning to call it abortion tourism. And I hate that term, but we're going to be finding a lot of women who are going to be coming to the United States coming to Maryland. We already know that a lot of women are flying on Southwest from Dallas to Baltimore to get reproductive health services, and we're going to need to we're going to need to have security full time outside these clinics that are trying to provide services as more people come here. And I think that that one of the things we have to do is, we, is women have to know when they come here that they're going to be safe. And so I just think that those are some things to think about. Um, sure. Let, let me. Do you, you want me to speak to that or, yeah, or if you want to, sure. And I've got yeah. and then, and then we've got questions. We've got plenty of time. Questions are loading up, so we're doing well. Sure. I I, I remember as Lieutenant Governor in the O'Malley Brown administration, um, and again after Sandy Hook, uh, we invested a lot in um school security uh measures. Um, and a lot of that was um physical uh securities improvements to to the buildings, the structures themselves, doors and windows and points of entry. Um, I think we made it available um, to uh, non-public uh, schools. Um, you uh, did, we did. A lot that. of our schools have been recipients of that money, and I know it started under your and Martin's administration. Thank you. And, and I will say that, you know, I mentioned the three big provisions, uh, or certainly two of the three big provisions coming out of uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, gun safety legislation this week on the Hill. Uh, the third one being to incentivize red flag laws um, and in states that don't want red flag laws to accommodate um, uh, everyone, uh, the monies will be available for states that uh, implement like veterans courts and drug courts. But putting that aside, the, some, some of the other provisions will be uh, additional federal funding for security at schools and other um, high risk uh, targets uh, and and which are um, synagogues, churches, child uh, care centers, um, and um, it's my understanding that 
that it'll be broadly defined in terms of security. It won't be limited just to physical security, like improvements to buildings and facilities. Um, but um, as of now, it's my understanding that it would could also be used uh, for you know the staffing police or other security staffing yeah. for facilities. So we should anticipate some federal funds. I think the attorney general is going to play an important role um, working with the general assembly to figure out um, how those dollars, those federal dollars are going to be deployed. Uh, and of course, as attorney general, uh, I don't see my role simply as advocating for my budget, uh, but to be able to advocate for uh, budgets in areas uh, that improve public safety broadly, whether I have direct responsibility or not. So I'll, I'll work with the community on that as well. Thank you. Uh, question, um, Alex Stone, a friend of mine who's a leader in the Kent Mill Jewish community. Hey, wave Alex, how are you? Um, do you want to ask your question directly, Alex? I'll take, your, take yourself off of um, mute and why don't you ask Anthony Brown directly your question. Certainly, Congressman, I mean, you, you addressed a lot of this. Uh, I have a friend here in Kent Mill whose son is in the AG's office and is looking to know how will you support, and I've heard you talk about this and you just did address it, um, the attorneys who are on the front lines there in your office across the state uh, as they pursue some of the agendas uh, items that you have on there to sort of, I guess it's more of an administrative question than a, um, than a legal question. Uh, as you infuse uh, your, you know, your ideology and sort resources and support in the office to the other attorneys. First thing I got to do is fight for a pay raise. I can tell you right now. I do know from personal experience that the men and women who serve in state government, I think this is true in the office of the attorney general and most state uh, agencies, uh, we find uh, ourselves, they find themselves um, uh, sandwiched uh, between uh, the federal government who tends to pay more uh, and local government that tends to pay more. Uh, so the men and women who work in state government and certainly the Office of the Attorney General are truly in it because they believe it's a noble calling, uh, that it's important work. Um, and again, I referenced back yesterday uh, to the celebration of life of Steve Sachs. And I met one of his former deputies uh, who said, you know, when Steve first came into the office, um, he made perhaps uh, delivered one of the most inspiring um, statements to the men and women in that office about the important role that they play, the difference they make in the lives of, of Marylanders. So certainly I, I would hope, and I think I through my 30 years of experience uh, in the trenches, both literally and figuratively with men and women in, in uniform who sacrifice so much uh, in the trenches in, in Annapolis and on Capitol Hill, um, that my, my responsibility, and I think that of the attorney general is you've gotta be an inspirational leader uh, but more than that, or in addition to that, you have to be a leader that can fight for the resources that your team needs. If the Consumer Protection Division is truly going to protect uh, Marylanders from you know, predatory lenders and fraudulent and deceptive trade practices, we've got to have the best technology, the best training, uh, and the best uh, staff to get that done. So you've got to fight for that. Uh, I've got experience in doing that. I've been a manager. I've been an executive. Um, you know, I think there's this misunderstanding uh, that the attorney general spends all day in court. In fact, Brian Frost spends more time in Annapolis uh, during the 90-day legislative session engaging members of Congress, the leadership, rank and file, budget issues, authority issues, personnel issues, shaping the law type issues um, than, he, than, than he ever spends in court. I mean, you can ask Brian, I don't know the exact numbers, I don't keep tab of his schedule, um, but if he's been there for eight years, uh, and, and he has, uh, and the legislative session lasts 90 days a year. Um, he has served for the equivalent of two years of the legislative session. And within those two years, I bet you Brian has spent 18 months of his time in Annapolis. He's probably spent less than 18 days in a courtroom. So while it's important, we all have to be lawyers. Uh, you're not, the attorney general does not come to the position as the primary trainer of lawyers. The lawyers in that office have more experience than any attorney general stepping into those shoes, perhaps since Steve Sachs. Um, so you've got to be an inspirational leader, a, a manager. You've got to be re re able to recruit and retain the best um, uh, talent out there. And it needs to be diverse. It has to reflect the diversity of Maryland, right? We are now the fourth most diverse state in the nation. Um, and um, 
the office should reflect that because I do think that diversity of, of, of background and thought and perspective um, um, leads to better problem solving uh, and, and, and innovation and creative thinking, uh, which is essential for, for that office to serve the people of Maryland. Thank you, Anthony. I'm going to ask uh, Betsy to unmute herself and ask her question directly. Good morning, Congressman. And, and my questions may um, reflect my, um, I served in the New York Attorney General's office at the beginning of my career and then spent more than 30 years as a consumer protection attorney at the Federal Trade Commission. So I have two questions. And the first is how you see the relationship between the office of the Attorney General and the governor, understanding that sometimes that can be a fraught relationship. Uh, the second question is whether you think Maryland's laws on privacy and data security are sufficient and if not, how you would like to see them changed. Thank you so Excellent. much. All right, thanks, Betsy. And thanks for your service uh, in New York and now federally um, in service to, to the public. Um, you know, the attorney general um, and the governor uh, um, are independently elected, um, but they have um, a, uh, a, a unique relationship, right? The, the attorney general represents uh, the state, its agencies, the General Assembly, the governor, the depart executive departments uh, in you know, representing the interests of the state. Um, but we know as attorneys uh, that when an attorney has a fundamental disagreement with their client, uh, then they can seek uh, to terminate that relationship. Now, what does that mean? I mean, the, the attorney general has to represent uh, the governor. So I'll, I'll point to last summer as an example, Brian Frosch, uh, had a fundamental disagreement uh, with Governor Hogan on whether or not to continue um, uh, dispersing uh, federally funded unemployment insurance benefits. And Governor Hogan elected not to do so. He was challenged in court and Brian chose not to represent him based on a fundamental disagreement. Brian did the responsible thing, which was to assist his client, the governor at the time, uh, with, with uh, obtaining outside counsel. And it worked. Now, I'm not commenting on whether or not I would have taken the same position as Brian did. I supported the federal the extension of federal um, unemployment insurance benefits. Um, but my point is where there's a fundamental disagreement between the attorney. There are ways to handle that uh, when it comes to the formal representation of the governor. And I also believe that um, that the attorney general who's independently elected should publicly speak on um, on issues, certainly legal issues policy issues, legislative issues, uh, even when uh, they are inconsistent with that of, of the governors. You're independently elected and you should do that. And I think, um, again, I, I constantly refer back to Steve Sachs who you know, ran on a platform uh, of being independent from the governor. Uh, now that was also a time in Maryland's history where there's a lot of public corruption um, at the highest levels and Steve took that on uh, vigorously. Uh, in terms of the question around uh, data privacy and protection, look, I think we, we continue to wrestle with that at both the state level and the federal level. Uh, Maryland and other states have probably made more progress um, on protecting uh, data privacy, <clears throat> excuse me, than the federal government. Beyond HIPAA, where I think you know um, information privacy in, in the in the context of health information, um, I think is is well established. Uh, but when it comes to data privacy, uh, uh, um, individual privacy around data collected from platforms like Facebook and every single app we have on our on our device, I think a lot of work need more work has to be done um, in order to protect um, uh, Marylanders' privacy and to protect the privacy of those who who visit Maryland. I'm already anticipating. Uh, that, as Ron mentioned, that that woman who gets on that Southwest airline flight to travel to um, um, uh, Maryland uh, to seek uh, abortion services, uh, the district attorney in Texas is going to want her information, her location app information, um, the Google searches that she's done while in Maryland, her Fitbit information while in Maryland. Uh, and we've got to find ways that we can protect uh, that data uh, as well, because I can assure you that as Attorney General, um, I will resist every effort uh, by uh, law enforcement from outside of the state uh, to collect evidence uh, to, to prosecute um, someone who comes to Maryland um, uh, for those services. Uh, but I think the short answer is we've got more work to do on, on, uh, on uh, data privacy. Um, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big um, fan, if you will, uh, of uh, plain language disclosures. And I think one of the problems we have 
uh, is we have these very complicated to understand and read disclosure um, statements uh, to people, whether they're going to opt in or opt out of providing or, or, or joining something or downloading something, and whether there's data available. Um, I think we need to go back to what the Securities and Exchange Commission did many, 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 many years ago, plain language um, notices and statements um, in, the, in the context of investments. <laughs> We've got to do that in the context of, um, of of any activities where that would require you to either disclose personal information or would allow someone to collect um, information about you because of your your activities. Um, so a big fan of, of disclosures, plain language disclosures, opt in versus opt out um, requirements, uh, and we'll certainly work with uh, advocates in the General Assembly to strengthen our laws. Great, thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Betsy, for those great, two great questions and for your service in New York. Um, and uh, I'm originally from New York, Long Island, too. Huntington. Brooklyn born and bred. I'm actually half my life now exactly in Maryland, half myself. So when the Nets play the, 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 play the Mets, I'm, I'm in perpetual uh, divisive mode internally. Um, Manhattan. <laughs> Oh, you're from Manhattan. You're a Yankee fan. Okay. So, so uh, my, my question to you is Lisa, uh, I asked Lisa a chance, but she, I'm going to ask her question directly. Um, Anthony, what are your thoughts about decriminalizing substance and addiction issues? Are you an anti-racist, a term coined by uh, Professor Kendi? And how do you perform? I can ask them. So one is, what is your thoughts on, on decriminalizing substance and addiction issues? The second question is, are you an anti-racist? And the third is, how do you propose to reform the criminal justice system to make it fair for all? Great. Um, and that's, uh, um, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try to be brief because each one of those raises a lot. Ask me the first question first and, and please uh, ask me the second and third when I finish my brief answers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ask me the first one again, please. The first one first. Thought about, I'll just go in order. What are your thoughts about decriminalizing substance and addiction issues? Sure. Totally support it. Um, and look, um, um, uh, there are a few things I think we need to decriminalize. First, we de decriminalized uh, uh, marijuana back in the day. We're now moving towards uh, adult lawful use. I think we're moving in the right direction um, and, and sort of consistent with that. Um, you know, when you've got drug and, and mental and behavioral health issues, um, where often, you know, uh, plays out in criminal activity, you know, first and foremost, we need to be addressing the criminal, the, the public health aspects of those, uh, of that activity, that, that conduct. Um, I think it's more humane. I think it's less expensive uh, to divert people uh, to drug and alcohol addiction and treatment and counseling programs, mental health services, than to incarcerate them. So I'm a big fan of diversionary programs. Maryland doesn't use diversionary programs uh, enough. We over-incarcerate in Maryland. I think, um, in Mar I think in Montgomery County, we have a very active drug court that works quite well, actually. And, and Prince George's has one as well. And, and the question is, does every drug, every drug, does every judge um, use um, those diversionary programs. We have veterans courts where we recognize that often veterans are involved in, in criminal behavior because of um, conditions uh, um, uh, like PTSD um, uh, acquired during their service. So we try to divert them you know, to, to, to health programs to get them health, get, get them better than incarcerate. We need to do more of that. So uh, yes, I'm a big fan of, of these diversionary programs focusing more on the health aspects, less on the criminal aspect. Uh, whether you decriminalize or not, I mean, I'm not sure we'll get the General Assembly to say that just because there's a mental health related issue uh, that it should be decriminalized. Uh, but we also know that mental health uh, conditions of a defendant um, ought to be and often are and should be taken into consideration when it comes to a disposition of a case. So yes, I support that. Second, second, question. Question. Yeah, second question is, are you an anti-racist? Well, I really do need someone to uh, define anti-racist as as defined by um, by Professor Kennedy. Uh, I knew him at Harvard. I didn't take a class Kennedy, with him. Kennedy, Kennedy. I'm sorry, Kennedy. I said Kennedy, right? Yeah, but it's Kennedy, Professor Kennedy. Kennedy. Oh, Kennedy. Okay, so I'm sure Kennedy, familiar. who's the author of the term anti racist had to be right. So maybe I should apologize, but I, I'm not embarrassed to, to um, betray my my ignorance on this one. I don't know the definition of anti-racist. Uh, okay. The third is how do you perform? And I oh, think you kind of, does, does, does the questioner want to, the person that raised the question want to define it and let me answer it? Well, you know, I read about two, th uh, if they'd like to, Lisa, would you like to define the term anti-racist? 
basically, I would say just on a regular basis, actively combating racism at every level, you know, of sure. the systems and, and society for Maryland. Sure. Listen, and, thank and you. I assume that that's what it was. And listen, the answer is yes. And, you know, you know, I'm on the Armed Services Committee um, and it's my it's my reason for being in Congress. I spent 30 years in the military. And when I got elected to Congress and I got assigned to that committee, I was excited about the opportunities to to, you know, work on so many different issues. And when I look back on my six years, I have spent more time on fighting racism um, uh, in the military than anything else. And I I do it with joy, but it's a hell of a burden. I'm going I'm about to go to Washington today. And instead of kind of participating vigorously in conversations about the nuclear triad and our forced posture in the Indo-Pacific and whether or not um, the European Deterrence Initiative is doing all the things it was designed to do six years ago, and I've got a lot of experience in those issues, I'm going to spend most of my time this afternoon batting back Republican efforts to, 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 to rid the military of critical race theory, which doesn't exist. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to be promoting um, um, uh, our pro, you know provisions that that identify and root out extremism in the military, and that's what I've spent the last six years doing, making that institution a fairer, more just, uh, equitable, and inclusive um, uh, organization. We think about our military, and we think, oh wow, what a great place! Everyone has an opportunity, and yeah, well, you're thinking about you know Harry Truman's military when he desegregated the military by executive order. That that institution has tremendous problems. And as much as I love that institution, I take it on every day to combat racism that happens in the ranks of the military. If you're a, if you're an African-American airman, um, you are two and a half times more likely to be investigated, prosecuted, and discharged from the military for the same conduct as your white counterpart. Did you ever feel any racism in the military, Anthony? You know, I feel it every day. I mean, what does it look like and how do you navigate it? Um, but I'm very mindful of because I'm reminded daily uh, of the significance of race uh, in America. Um, and like you, Ron, and what you pointed out in a different context, you know, Maryland's a pretty good state to be in, you know, when you compare it to states like Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and I'm not trying to pick on those two states because, quite frankly, you can go to Boston, Massachusetts and feel it as well. No, we, we, um, can pick on, we can pick on them. It's okay. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, listen, in Maryland, we've got a higher percentage of young black men behind bars than Mississippi does. In fact, Maryland has the yeah. highest percentage. Yep, We have the highest percentage of black men behind bars in any other state. We we prosecute wow. and incarcerate even adjusted for population because we have a large African-American uh, community or population in Maryland, even adjusted for the size of our population. Maryland incarcerates the highest percentage of eight black men, 18 to 24 than any other state. So in some, that's why I started earlier this this, this morning's pro, you know, uh, Zoom saying, look, we're not going to investigate and prosecute our, our, our way to safe neighborhoods. We're not. Crime is on the rise. We are. We're, we're prosecuting and we're prosecuting the hell out of black people. Um, and, um, and so unless you reform the system, and I think this I think the, which acts as a segue into the third part of the question, which is reforming the criminal justice system. We've got to reform it. Juvenile justice reform um, and kind of connected to your first question, uh, the first part of the question about decriminalizing mental health. I support a provision that was introduced this year in Annapolis. If you have a child who's involved in a misdemeanor that does not include a gun, and not every misdemeanor, but most misdemeanors, and we can define that, then incarceration should be off the table. Data shows that when we incarcerate children, all we do is send them to an institution where they can sharpen and improve their skills on their path to becoming hardened criminals. Like a university for... Right. It is. Uh, I know. So, Anthony, we've got seven minutes left, and I am one of these people who really tries to end calls on time. You're sitting back, your feet are on the table, your feet are on your desk, your hands are like this, you're drinking a cup of coffee, and you're looking back at eight, having served eight years as attorney general. You're saying, Ron, I'm done. And you say, or well, maybe you're thinking about a run for governor, or maybe <laughs> whatever it is. I don't know if my wife will let me do that one. I'll be 69 then. 
We got Peter Francho. He's uh, older than that. He's running, so never say never. Um, and I'm not suggesting that 69 is too old. I'm sure there may be one or two 69 year olds on this uh, phone call, but at 69, I'm not sure I want to be doing that. I, I understand that. When you look back, you're having a cup of coffee, or you're lying in bed and still and still staring at the ceiling at night, looking back at eight years of Attorney General. Is there one or two things that you want to say? I'm glad I got this done. Yeah, one of the things, and I and I also did include this in in my uh, uh, written response uh, to the um, uh, to the the questionnaire, um, is I, I do want to establish um, the uh, sort of an independent unit. Uh, to take on uh, civil rights enforcement in Maryland. It does not exist today, um, with the exception of um, uh, voting rights, uh, voting suppression, I should say, voter suppression, and the Attorney General um, has concurrent jurisdiction, if you will, with or authority, prosecutorial authority with the state, with the state prosecutor. Um, there's very limited authority for the uh, Attorney General brings civil rights um, enforcement cases. They either go to the Maryland Civil Rights Commission, they do a good job, uh, or individual plaintiffs uh, can bring them. Um, and I'd like to establish a, 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 a within the civil rights division that currently exists, um, a unit that can enforce, um, and whether we're talking about um, you know voting rights, whether we're talking about the rights of the LGBTQI plus community, I'm a proud father of a transgender son, um, and um, and I want to I want to make sure that you know regardless of your orientation or or gender um, identification that that you enjoy the rights and the privileges of of, of living in America, um, and and also you know things and we talked about it before you know a woman's right to choose all of these are uh, civil rights I believe and 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 I would I would I would I'd, I would want to leave the Attorney General's office hopefully that one won't take eight years uh, with the authority to bring uh, those actions on behalf of Marylanders I think many Marylanders assume that the Attorney General can, uh, because in some states they can, either because they have common law authority, um, which the Maryland Attorney General uh, doesn't have, or because their legislatures or constitution have um, granted them the authority to bring those types of actions. And then on that note, unless there's something else you'd like to add um, and conclude, it's 926. I like, and I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who joined us on this Zoom. And Anthony, thank you for making yourself available to us. Um, on a personal note, thank you for your consistent support for the state of Israel while a member of Congress. Um, unless you have anything to add, we can declare this, uh, this Zoom over and thank you and get you on the road three minutes earlier than we promised. Yep, just wanna say thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, as you know, um, early vote starts July 7th. Uh, get an absentee or mail-in ballot. I've, I've already voted myself uh, for myself as well. Uh, and that must course, be an interesting feeling when you see your name on the ballot and you vote for yourself. <laughs> Don't make a mistake. Don't mess <laughs> up. Uh, and of course, election day is July 19th. So if you want to wait till then, that's great. It's less than four weeks from now. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to stop by. Appreciate our relationship. Look forward to our continued partnership uh, when I am your attorney general um, with, uh, you know, if that works out that way. <laughs> uh, two, two things I want to let everybody know that the JCRC will be distributing a nonpartisan voters guide, which includes the information that Anthony filled out to 66,000 um, uh, 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 Jewish Democrats and Jewish Republicans in Montgomery County. And I also want to note the presence of Ken Reichard, who's on the phone, who is the longtime able uh, uh, aide to uh, Senator Ben Cardin, who's been a great friend of ours. On that note, and Tom Huck, I've already noted, and I see our past president, Rabbi Jack Luxembourg, and everybody, my rabbi, and wishing you to everybody here on this call a, a great rest of the week.